Right. So a special good morning again and welcome to this session. Right. So I was saying there that uh, we are going to finish up 3.3 now and we're going to bridge into 3.4. The rest of that will be on the uh, 7 PowerPoint. You would have gotten that on the 6th of the 6th. If not, use your books. You will have the information in three places. You have it on the video. You have it in your textbook. You have it on your PowerPoint. You just need one. You, you don't need to study three things in three different places, just need it one place. Plus you are making your own notes. Hopefully you are making your notes as we go through the class. So that's four ways of getting the information, right? So 3.3, if you have your textbook, I'll just open it briefly. Um, you're gonna see uh, how human factors, right? Human factors which influence safety related behavior, right? And th there is a question here. Right, so human factors is uh, very common for exam. It's just like two pages. You could use your book, play back the recording. You could use it from there. Make your own notes. You could use it from there. Right. The point is that you get it. So, how human factors influence uh, behavior positively or negatively? We are going straight into that. Right. So we have here. So human factors involve the following factors that could influence behavior at work in a way that could affect health and safety, um, job, individual, organization. I'll explain at the end, right? I want to explain every slide. Let me just read a couple first and then I'll explain. So individuals bring to their job, personal attitudes, skills, habits, personalities. The above may have a negative effect on task performance competence. Individual capabilities uh, include mental risk factors, for example, the person's language, especially if language is, uh, you know, like not English, right? Or like a second language. The case study for June for this month had a case study where they were migrant workers. They were workers who were not English speaking. Um, I'm not too sure if that was a question that was being asked. I'm just saying the case study had something like that that uh, an individual bring to their job then who they are and part of who you are it's all that you're looking at here, right? Your language, your education, your experiences, your competence, uh, if you're on medication, your stress levels, your fears, your personalities, any special needs that you may have, either they be physical or even mental special needs anyway. Um, individuals bring to their jobs, their height, their weight, their strength, their fitness, their age, any disabilities, uh, their gender, and again, their medical condition. Organization. Uh, we had seen this before, culture, you need to promote a positive safety culture. Culture needs to promote um, employee involvement and commitment at all levels. Leadership needs to demonstrate that deviation from established health and safety standards is not acceptable. Leaders need to give leadership, of course, they need to provide resources and proper communication to their workers. So human factors, the job includes the task to be done, the workload, the environment where the work is to be done, the procedure for doing the work, the layout of controls and displays for doing a task, the frequency duration, work pattern, and possible work breaks are all determined by the organization. I started reading, right? Aptitude. Aptitude is a person's capacity for learning something. An aptitude is an innate ability to do a certain kind of work. Aptitude may be physical or mental. Attitude to act consistently towards a particular object or situation based on an individual's learned experiences. Behavior and individual action due to attitude and perceived environment. Perception, the process of interpreting information through our senses. Um, anybody could read this for me? You can just read it out aloud. Um, A bit and a bit. Okay, good. I'll come back to them in a bit, right? I'll do all the explanation at the end. The arrows is pointing to, I'll come back to this too. This is not really an exam. This is just, think. anybody could read this for me? I couldn't anybody believe want... that I could actually understand what I was reading. The phenomenal power of the human mind, according to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the, word, the letters of the word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be in the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. 
rest of it, amazing, huh? And I always thought spelling was important, right? I'll explain this at the end. Um, seem to have a pop up here. Yeah, make sure they get rid of that. Okay. Um, you can alter a person's perception by providing information or appropriate information, instruction, training, and supervision. Attitude towards something can be changed if the perception is changed. Behavior can be changed if the attitude is changed. Propaganda and awareness campaigns can influence perception, attitude, and behavior. Propaganda definition is the organized dissemination of information to assist or damage a, polit a political cause. Why propaganda? It's a feel-good factor. It's company, public relation with respect to employees, clients, local population, media, enforcing authority and pressure groups. Uh, propaganda can raise motivation, productivity, and safety awareness, generating a desired attitude and behavior. It could reinforce positive safety culture. It could alter a worker's perception. It could help you to achieve your targets. For example, low accident rates and low sickness absenteeism. Awareness campaigns can be used to promote health and safety in the workplace, used to generate a desired attitude and behavior, can be used to adjust an employee's perception of risk in the workplace, promotes a positive safety culture, encourages employee participation. Motivation of an individual. Motivation is a driving force which makes an individual act. Motivation involves a condition or situation in which something is required or wanted. Drive or your personal drive to avoid a situation or to push or to urge forward. Incentives are something such as the fear of punishment or the expectation of reward that induces action or motivates effort. Reward could be money offered or given for some special services or like a safety, you know, a safety person that did something well, such as the return of a lost article or the capture of a criminal, a satisfying return or result that normally involves a profit. Psychology, the return for performance of a desired behavior or what is called positive reinforcement and reinforcement. Um, this last couple of ones here, they say if you have a positive safety culture, you would avoid all of these, which are called human failures. Human fails in a, a human fail in a number of ways, and that we make what are called errors. Our errors could be skill based or rule based. They are all called mistakes anyway, right? And our errors could actually be not our errors, our, our human failures could actually be a violation. Um this latter chart is not part of your syllabus. It's just something here on the diploma syllabus. But the point is here, if you have a good culture, then you avoid human failures and whether they be errors or violations. There are some differences in them. Those differences are not covered in your course anyway. But you can find them here, right? So I'll leave this last piece for you all to read out anyway um, because the latter part is not part of your syllabus, right? So um. The main thing you need to know here is actually this first slide. That's why if I'd explain it here, we would have been finished already, right? So the main thing you need to know is that this slide here, right, is that uh, if, you, if you look at your book, right, you'll see the same thing, right, Um, that there is a term called human factors. Look at here, human factors, right? So folks, whether or not, like I said, I mean, you all make some, some issues sometimes that are really irrelevant. The information you have, it, you could actually go and Google what is human factors, as if you're motivated enough, right? So you have your textbook, look at on the slide, you could even write your notes for yourself. There are three things that make up what are called human factors, right? One of them is you. So human factors is like a term, it's like an overarching term that is used to denote um, like what makes up culture in a company. We kind of came across this before in this whole chapter, right? Uh, anybody remember the, the definition for culture? Culture was was equal to what? What what is culture made up of? Culture is made up of. Uh... How we do things around here? Does it look star? Or you mean in terms of the organization, the statement of intent, and the arrangement? So could you say again? I uh, just heard part of it. If that was an answer. It's it's made up of the statement of intent, the arrangement, and the organization. But I thought when you asked me the definition, I thought you meant the way we do yeah. things around here. Right, very good. Um, 
But the first part you said, anybody want to help clear that up? The first part um, that was said, uh, really, that's the that that's the policy. That's actually chapter two. This is actually chapter three. The the policy is made up of the statement of intent, the organization, and the arrangement. That's actually chapter two, right? But culture. So the last thing that that you said was actually correct. The last thing um, is that um, culture is the way we do things are wrong. But anybody remember the formula for culture? The reason why I'm asking is because it's actually on this slide here. Anybody remember the formula for culture? What is culture Steve, equal to? The the worker and the Yes. Okay, very good. Excellent, right? So very good. Yeah, so culture is equal to two of these things from here. Culture is equal to the individual and the managers, which is, is, is the organization. But if you put one more term with it, which is the job factor, that is referred to as human factors. So two of them by themselves, individual and the organization, that is the definition for culture. But if you're add in one more term, which is the job factor. Those three factors are called human factors. You don't need to see it 10 places. You just need to write it down one time and learn it, right? So um, what I was going to tell you is that what Nibosh do, different sittings then, they ask, like they may ask in one sitting, like what are the individual factors that contributed to an accident? And then another certain, what are the management? Well, that's a sure question. Like you always get that. What is the management factors, right? And then in some settings, they ask, what is it job factors? So what you need to write down is not all these definitions I read today. It's not all those slides. What you need to write down is what I just told you, right? So that in some settings, you know, like if, if you mix it up, then, well, then you get it wrong because if they ask it job factors, a job factor, I can do it right on the same slide, right? A job factor, I read it from this slide, right? But a job factor is like the task that you're doing. I'll put on about three for each one, right? So the job factor is like the task. So if they ask, like, um, comment on the job factors that contributed to the accident, you cannot talk about the employee because the employee is not a job factor. The employee would have been an individual factor, right? But if they say, if they say comment on the job factor, well, then you're talking about things like the task. You're talking about things, you know, like um, the way the work was done, right? You're talking about if it involving pushing, pulling, lifting, lowering, right? That's what you're talking about. Just, just give me a minute, huh? Yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah. Um. So a job factor. Hopefully, you wrote down that one task and maybe like the way the work was done. But another one I had on this slide is like the duration of work, right? The duration of work. When you get some time, go back and read the slide. You'll see it. The duration of work. So um, we can just work with these two. So like, if they say, what are the the the, the job factors that contributed to an accident? You can talk about the task that was being done in the case study then. If it was, you know, like um, what I've seen in case studies, if it was moving a vehicle, if it was uh, moving furniture. So that's what you talk about. You say the job factors that contribute to the accident is the task, such as it involved moving furniture uh, from a lorry van to like a residential area. So that's what you talk about, right? Um, if they say job factors again, Folks, you, you just open the book or you just take back my slides, but you're thinking work, job factors have to do with work, right? So if the case study mentioned that work was done 2 uh, to T a.m., work was done like in the night shift, but then you say, well, the accident could have happened 
or what could have increased the risk of, of, of the accident is the fact that it was done in the night, right? So even things like environmental conditions, like lighting, that is what you have to talk about. You're going to get all of them from the case study. Um, and likewise, I mean, there's a uh, subtle as giving a tree in each one, but you can just use this slide. I'll go back and show you how much this slide have in it, right? If they ask it individual, individual is like the most, actually, you know, the second tested one. So you saw this slide before the individual factors would be things like um, the person's experience. Most case study talk about a young apprentice, uh, young employees, new employees. So then you talk about things like the person's age. You see an individual factor that could have contributed to the accident is their age. An individual factor is their training. Folks, I think you're getting it. The answers are not all on the slide and the answers are not all in the book. The answer is understanding the concept. The concept is that human factors comprises of three terms, the job, the individual, and the organization, and any one of them could come. The mistake students make is that when you all get the question, you all tread into the different ones and like, like somebody will go and talk about the manager, but the manager is not a job factor, nor is the manager an individual factor. Right. So this question, I said, like normally you get something on managers. What could the managers have done? I just put an M here for managers, right? So what the managers can do or could have done? It's all about things like proper communication. It's all about things like proper resources. Sort of what you saw on this slide, right? So it, maybe the manager shouted at the worker. Maybe there was no um handover. Maybe there was no orientation. Maybe there is no supervision. So those are the things that are under the control of the manager, right? But you cannot cross, you cannot cross into one from the other one based on what they ask. It is a very famous question. I am guaranteed that you're probably going to get managers. I'm not sure if you're going to get job or individual, but different past papers and different future papers, I guess, would ask different things anyway, right? Tell me if you get this, if you get this. I'll just go up, I'll just go back and show you the slides, and you'll see that's what it actually had had on the slides. As I said, if I'd explained it there, there would not have been a need to read the other slides. Right? Tell me what you think. Think you get it? Yes, sir. Okay, good. All right, just now again. Huh? Just give me a minute. I have a student at the office here. All right. Um, okay, so let's have a look back at the slide. So therefore you'll see, but remember the, 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 the catch with slides is that remember these answers, these answers really is just a guide that remember, okay, like you cannot use, like you wouldn't be able to use language if the case study did not say language. If they didn't say language was an issue. But the one in June did. So those students could have said language, right? So that's the, that's the trick. Because the trick is, this is not your source of answer. The source of answer is that you just have to understand the concept. Individual have to do with the person. And you have to base yours now on the case study, right? Like medication may not be an answer. If the case study didn't mention that, did not mention that the worker was ill, well, it, you cannot use medication. Folks, I think you're getting it. I feel like you could use the others though. Education, experience, competence, stress. You might not be able to use fears if the participant never said nothing on fears. So that's why understanding is better than this, better than the book then. Understand it. Once you understand the concept, you can now draw out your answers from your case study. Right? Let me uh, do one more again. Uh, I'm probably going to stick it on the job factors. Right. So like the job factors, I, I think these could be you. I mean, this could could be used. But look at this one. Right. This one says the layout of controls and the, the display, the display for doing a task. Now, if the question didn't have any control panel, you can't use that. 
You just have to see what task the worker was doing. If it was moving chemical barrels or something, if it was that, well then, you know, you see, okay, it involves manual handling, right? So these are just a guide, right? For you to understand the concept, right? Just give me, or if you want to get just listening on the conversation then, right? So there's a book under there for you to sign for receiving it. I think under where the, no, no, right there, on top. Yeah, yeah, under that, yeah. See if it marked dispatch. Yeah, and you could assign it. Yeah, good. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, some of these I believe could always work, right? The frequency of work. Frequency means how often the worker are working. Duration is how long. Work patterns is if they have a shift. So if you read the question and it says the workers are working 12 hours, right? They're working 12 hours shift without a break. Definitely you could use that one, right? But there is no comprehensive list then. That's the thing about the case study. Uh, you want to have a look at your book a bit? Because we finish here, you know. There's, there's, everything else is just supplementary to this. If you turn the page, you'll see you have to finish 3.3. .3. When you turn it to risk perception, right? So if you take a look at your book, you'll see they did mention under the organization, they mentioned the health and safety culture, commitment and leadership. We have some of that right here too, right? You'll see it if I try to line it up. Here, culture, leadership, resources, work pattern, same thing in the book, right? Levels of supervision, consultation, training. So the thing is, is to look out to see what you get in your exam. So that's the good thing about an open book exam. You don't have to study, but you have to know what is what, and you cannot write your own question. You cannot do something then that you feel to do. If they ask your job, you cannot write about management. If they ask your management, you cannot write about job. So um, organizational factors would work for, like we have them here. I have communication. The book has a two. I all seen it. Communication. And if, if you don't have the book or you don't have one of the source of information, yeah, very good, yeah? If you don't have one of the source of information, it's the same thing. Uh, communication is on this line. Communication is in the book. If you have just one, one is enough. And then you're here in a class and then you can make your own notes, right? Um, then we have uh, uh, levels of supervision. Look, I have it written down here. Levels of supervision. It's in the book as well. And you can make up your own. It's not about being limited to a text because what you see in the case study. So if you read the case study then, right? If you read the case study and it said... Um, the managers did not review the risk assessments, but that's not in the book. So would you ignore that answer? You cannot ignore the answer. Your source of answer is always the case study, right? If you read the case study, I'm trying to remember some. If you read the case study and it said, um, the manager hired his friend. The manager hired his friend to do a task, right? Now that's not here. That's not an organizational fact in the book, but it is an answer. Because if the, if the passive person, the manager hired his friend, you know, to be the consultant, whether uh, that's an organizational factor. So folks, remember, the concept is bigger than the textbook. If you write anything down, you must write down what I tell you coming for exam, right? If it comes now, if, you know, you could just open the book and you can get some answers there, but don't ignore the ones that you're seeing in the case study, right? Um. Again, organizational factor, folks, doesn't have to be bad. Eh? Re remember, culture could be positive and negative. Like it had a question, it could have been the May paper that said the supervisor did return to do the investigation. The supervisor did cordon off the area where the accident happened. It's still an organizational factor. Now, cordoning off is not in the textbook, right? Accident investigation wow. is not here, nor is it there. But you cannot ignore that as an organizational factor, right? So, folks, again, you know, play back the recording, make your notes, understand this is tertiary education and not secondary school. All the answers are never in one particular place. You could often Google as well, right? If you're looking at, I mean, if you're looking at the case study and, you know, I'm just saying, to me, I find it's obvious when they say the manager came back and he did the investigation. The manager did first aid. So, the, so these are positive things about the manager. These are positive culture, you know, like about the manager. So you can't ignore that. But what I'm saying is that if you should run out of ideas, 
You could just Google what a positive things a manager can do, what are negative things about a manager, right? You are never limited for answers, especially when you are the source of the answer, right? All right, I've taken that off. Let me know if you have any questions. That is the FASIPA questions as to which one will come. I'm not sure. I could sort of guarantee management will come because they often love every party but have a management question. The weirdest one is job. Job is the weirdest one. And uh, the sentence when job comes, people don't open their book for some strange reason. Look at right in the book. Look at right here too on the slide. Look at on Google. Look at on the video, right? And some people, like I said, they tread, they tread and they get into management and individual at which time you get it wrong because they didn't ask the individual or management. If they ask job, they ask job, right? So just to show you some things on this slide, I've taken off everything and we are done with this. Um, so just some things on this slide, that's what you will see on this slide, right? You see the, the job factors. All of this here is just like to see that you can change somebody's behavior if you feed them new information. So that's what this was all about. If you wonder what was this all about, this is not really new boss. This is to tell you that sometimes what you think may be true is not true. And you could actually alter a person's perception by giving them new information through their senses, such as, you know, I guess lectures like this one, videos, meetings, whatever have you, right? And the more you talk about safety, the more somebody's perception will change, right? So like this one, the first time you saw this, you probably thought you couldn't read it. But this is just about perception. It's not really safe. This is just to say the way we think could change. And I think the way we think have to change, right? Um, I, I think then, you know, like, uh, so this is not just for safety, but think about yourself. Like the way you think now should be different. Now your core characteristics are still there, like your drive, what motivates you, who you are. That's your personality. That's that. That's your aptitude. Who you are. Your innate ability to understand. Your innate drive then to got you to where you are in your life now. That's called your aptitude, right? Like no one messes with that. That is how they say um. The cream always rises to the top. You know, like, you could check some of your own circumstances that you would have gone through. You might not have started where you wanted to start, but you're getting there or you have gotten there in some ways then, right? So that's your innate ability to push through your innate ability. That, that, like, that's your drive, right? But we're not talking about that. We're talking about your perception, like the way you would have thought about yourself then, or I guess even about work and safety at 16 years old. Like at 16 years old, like you you may not have thought about a career in safety. You might not have think safe there, right? But the age you are now, the age you are now, you should be thinking differently. Your innate personality is still there, but your thoughts should be a bit different. Your thoughts should be, you know, a bit more mature. And what 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 are, like what accounts for that is what you would have gone through. So your perception can change. And what they were saying here is that your perception could change, right? If you want to know what was wrong with this, this is actually, um, this is, a, this is a, 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 um, actually a bird in the, the bush. The T-H-E is there twice, right? A bird in the, the bush, right? So, you know, um, like it's just to say, like, like what you think may be correct is not always correct then. What you think may be, you know, like a, a, a safety glasses is not important, but that could change then, right? That could change if we alter your perception by giving you new information and training. If somebody says what well, they had, that is not important. But then you saw somebody got struck with something on their head and they had on a hard hat. So for you, that made the difference that from now on you are wearing your hard hat, right? So that's the idea. And the whole thing about propaganda here is what we do with safety. Like this is propaganda. Propaganda is just information you're getting, right? Safety meetings on the morning, safety video, the company in talking, walking, sleeping, eating, breathing, safety. That's all propaganda. It's all there to alter your perception and to get you to work safe, right? Um, so if you realize that like, companies have different safety programs or, or like they'll have a safety week, 
right? So what's the point of a safety week? The point of a safety week is the same thing. It's to change your perception about how you think about safety, right? If you read the third point, can be used to adjust. So that's, a, that's an interesting word. It could be used to adjust an employee's perception of risk in the workplace. Could promote a positive safety culture. Could encourage employee participation. And for those of us who don't know, the people who plan a safety week, okay, like even today, I'll share about today. I'll, I'll talk about today's class, right? And the people who plan a, a safety week, what they try to do, they try to figure out what, what do you want, right? So if you could find out what an individual wants, you could actually tailor the safety week to that then, right? So like for some managers, they do not need money. I'm talking about a safety week and I'll talk about the class just now, right? It's like for a safety week, some managers don't want money, but you say, Hello. you know, but you say, yeah. if, if you come Hello. to the safety Hello. week, Hello. you know, I, I could remove this person from this conversation now. Yeah? Y'all just be careful of your mic, please. Yeah, so uh, for a safety week, I was saying, right, like um, like some managers, they don't need money, but what they want is recognition, right? So like a manager may come to a meeting, but the manager wants to be told psychologically, like at the end of the week you have, like the person wants to hear like their name was mentioned and like they were there for all the days. They came in, they helped you set up they were there on time, right? Maybe they helped you in certain number of safety weeks. So in giving your thanks, you can say I want to thank Frank. Frank is one of our directors who has been here from day one. So some people want that then, right? So some so 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 they may have that that need for reinforcement, but the average worker, an average worker, so if you say you are having you are having a safety week, right? But then you want to say, well, how do you attract the average worker? So you can put in your safety week. Well, for the week, we are giving out prizes. Um, there's a door prize. If anybody comes in, you're given a number and the door prize is money. And then if anybody takes part by answering a question, I have done this. I have done this, right? I have been to different meetings where I have given out like $100, but $20 a question, right? So like, you know, if anybody answers, you give them $20, Right. So some people like the first day you do that, the very next day your meeting is filled. Because if you give out one hundred dollars by by the by the next by the end of the day, like the word gets out then, well, you know, uh if you go safety meeting, you could probably win a hundred dollars. Or you give out well, what what works well, folks, no offense, what works well, this is not really meant to be offensive in any way. I just tell them what works well in Trinidad and maybe Guyana is food. Right. So like if you have, you know, like uh, you give out a pizza, pizza hut, uh, somebody that comes in, you know, and I myself, when I was in the UK, uh, when I was in the UK um, in an Irish meeting, just to make a long story short, they asked, see, see if I look at answer this, this question, right? They asked, um, what's the name of the fourth ghost? Yes, ghost, right? In the story of... um. You know the story of Scrooge, you know Scrooge, the Christmas Carol, which came out from the UK. Well, I was there in December, and I'm going back this year, December again. But um, I was in an Irish meeting, so it's not just me telling you, and they had asked, and I want I want something, right? But I'll tell you what it was just now. Anybody can say, anybody remember, what's the name of the fourth ghost in uh, A Christmas Carol? And uh, I think that's the story with Scrooge. And here the thing, I was the only... I would say Caribbean because there wasn't any other Caribbean country or South American country there. Everybody is, is quote unquote from the UK. You know, and this is very this is very much a British story, right? A Christmas Carol happened in London. That that was written by Charles Dickens. And I, I was sure that somebody would have gotten it, right? And I sort of thought a bit because I try to remember what's the name of before it goes because they show that in Trinidad and maybe Guyana every Christmas they show you a Christmas carol. So a lot of people said, you know, the, the ghost of Christmas past or whatever have you. And uh, in my mind, I was saying no, right? Anybody really knows that? And what I got, I kept it, right? I actually have it today. This is probably 
15 years later, I, I kept one of the things that was given to me. I got a chocolate, of course. I got a chocolate, a uh, British chocolate, but then something else I was given, and I kept that, and I still have it with me today. Anybody knows the name of before it goes? I just want to tell you that when people plan meetings, they cater for different expectations. A manager may not want to get a chocolate, but a participant like me or the rest of other participants in the UK would have wanted some sort of treat. Anybody knows the answer? What's the name of before it goes on in the uh, Christmas carol? If not, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Make some guesses. Anybody knows the name of before it goes? You all know the Christmas carol. They show it every Christmas time around Trinidad. Yeah, I'm not too sure if they do it in Guyana as well. No guesses? But I don't have any chocolate to give you all, but I may have given away something. Come to think of it. All right, I'll keep I'll keep going, right? So what they say, if you, if you can do what I'm doing there, which is what that group did, Ayosh, you cater to the different needs of the persons in the in the crowd, well, you could have a better motivated workforce, right? And the last slide was saying, if you have a better motivated workforce, but well, this piece is not your course. This is the Nibosh Diploma now, right? that once you have a better motivated workforce, you end up with less human failures and human, human failures can be classified as errors or violations. There are different types of errors and there are different types of violations, none of which will come for you. But the point is, if you have a good safety campaign, you end up with safer workers, but then you reduce human failures. Folks, anybody guessing that that I mentioned there? Out of 21 of you, nobody has a guess to that? All right, I'll leave it, right? Um, okay, so if you turn your page, you realize the chapter is actually finished. Well, 3.3, .3, sorry. So we're going to get into 3.4. Keep your books open, those of us who have it. If you don't have it, keep looking at the slide. I'm going to change this slide now to the next slide that I had emailed to you all, right? If you don't have it, you have the video. If you have the book, that is sufficient. If you don't have any, you have the video and you can make notes as we go along, right? The point is, it's not about what's on the slide. The point is about the concept. I have some stuff for you to write here. This morning, I messaged you all. I'll tell you what I needed to write just now. I have some writing paper at hand, right? Um, okay, so the objectives of this session, to facilitate the meeting towards the following teams, the legal requirement for doing a risk assessment, the aim and objectives of risk assessment, how to identify hazards, the composition of a risk assessment team, what is a suitable and sufficient risk assessment? So I want to finish this as uh, it's not very long, right? Um, and there are certain things you will have to know. And then there are certain things I want you to write, right? So let's get straight into this one. So the aim and objectives, if you have your book, if you don't, you could write this down. You have it on the slide. So in the UK, this is the law that spoke about doing a risk assessment. It's Regulations 3 of the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulation 1999. You could find it on page 22 of your textbook. You could find it on this slide. You could find it because we just said it too. In addition to that, they don't really ask this. But this is the law for doing a risk assessment in the UK. If you notice, do you all notice something that it's not the HSWR? It's actually not the ACT. Right? It's not the HSWR. It's another law called Regulations 3 of the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulation 1999. Take a look at it, see if you can find it in the book. Let me know if you're okay with it and give me a minute again. Right, so what they say is um, to, doing, to doing a risk assessment is implied in section 2, 3 of the HSW Act, but the, the law that spoke about doing a risk assessment is regulation 3. Implied means it's not there. If you look at the HSW Act, which you could because you have it in your textbook in chapter 1, you would not see risk assessments. The point is it's not there. It's in this other law here, the Management of Health and Safety Regulation 1999, right? So... They have never asked that, so I'm moving on, right? Let me get this slide to go. 
So what is a hazard? We sort of did this when we first had our orientation. A hazard is a potential to cause harm. Same thing in the book. It can include articles, substances, plants or machines, methods of work, the working environment and other aspects of work organization. What is risk? Risk is the likelihood of harm occurring and its severity, the likelihood of potential harm from the hazard being realized. And risk as a formula, you can probably find this right on the slide here looking at you, if it's not in the book, right? Um, I'm not seeing too much of it in the book. You can take it right from the slide here, right? So risk is equal to likelihood by severity. And anybody remember the numbers that we use on this? What, what, like, what's the numbers we use on a risk assessment? Numbers one. Right. What's the numbers we use on a risk assessment? Folks, if you'll have me after the same thing three times, I'm going to end this meeting and get you all to read your book at home. Huh? Right. Is it one to five? Right, very good. It's one to five. Remember, it's 21 of you all here, only one or two of you all um, talking this morning, huh? Right? A Zoom class is meant to be interactive, especially a course like this, right? The numbers are one to five, right? So if you all remember, I can have some worked out here. So we don't need to read every single thing down to the wire. I have some worked out here, right? Like, remember, um, there are about three ways you can do a risk assessment. Qualitative is just saying high, medium, or low. But most companies don't say high, medium, or low. They use a number-based system, very good, one to five. And you can calculate the risk. The higher numbers you get, like the higher to 25 you get, the risk is seen to be like, you know, like high risk. It, it's like red. And if it's red, it seems to be unacceptable. You have to stop the job. If you work out a risk assessment one by one, one, or two by two, four, that seems to be okay. You may have to improve, but it's okay. Anything in the yellow could be, you could, Work, work could continue, but you may have to be under, you know, like supervision, etc. right? So you see, I have had some here. Uh, let me try this one, right? Example, electric kettle overheating due to the failure of a thermostat. The risk is uh, likelihood by severity. I would have said it like it is five, severity is four. Five by four is 20, 20 is too high, 20 is in the red. So then we have to stop the work and you have to put in controls in place to reduce the risk. This is just an electric kettle. This is what everybody have or some people have in their kitchen. We could ensure it's regularly maintained. We could have something called PAT testing. That's something from the UK, portable appliance testing. It would not come for you. Not because something is new means it's coming. It's not new to you. It's new to you, but it's not new in the UK. PAT testing is nothing new, right? PAT stands for portable appliance testing. Frequent inspection, once that is done, the risk may go down to two by three. Two by three is not perfect, it's six, but however, six is in the kind of green, so that's better, or six is in the yellow, but the, but the lower uh, yellow. So work could continue, so you could keep using your kettle, right? And normally risk assessment is captured on a spreadsheet, like a table. This is just a basic idea of one. So you can take your task, manual handling. The first thing you look at, what is your hazards? Who could be harmed? What controls you have in place already? You work out your risk assessment, five by four, 20. 20 is too high, so you put further controls in place and you work it out again. This is called residual risk, three by two is six. Uh, task here, cleaning out a battery charger panel. The hazard is electric shock. Who could be harmed? People in the vicinity. The existing controls is that they have a permit to work and they have lockout tagout already. So the risk is low because if the lockout tagout, I mean, the risk is low. Two by four is eight. However, eight is not perfect. So you can still put further controls. We could disconnect the cable from the battery. At this time, we have no power at all. So it's kind of the lowest you'll get. One by one is one. And this is the idea of what a risk assessment is, right? So... Um, that was just to show you what it looks like. And the only thing you need to know again here is this. There are some steps to doing a risk assessment. These steps are called the five steps to doing a risk assessment. Like I would have steps here. This is actually a document. This is actually a book. Well, a guidance. If you remember, 
the class on guidances, right? This is actually a booklet, the five steps of doing a risk assessment. And this is our main slide for us to talk about now. But we have kind of talking, we have kind of spoken about it already, but there's a reason why we have to stop at this slide, right? So if you have your book, you can try to line that up. You can find some of this on page 27. Same thing, the five steps of doing a risk assessment. You just need to see it once. You could actually Google it if you find it. You, 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 like, yeah, like these two versions, right? You can, and we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna talk about them now so you could write it down for yourself, right? Just need to learn it once. All right, so, um, so what I'll say here, I'm just gonna back it up a bit, right? So remember, Nibosh is like twofold. When I say twofold, well, one of it is that we need to know that there's an exam at the end there, right? So like, you know, you have to always treat certain work with respect, right? Certain things like this one here, you know, like, okay, like the law for doing a risk assessment, we said these things don't really come. Wherever you see laws today, remember they don't ask, they don't ask what is anymore. So anything where you see law, it doesn't come. And if it comes, great. Open the PowerPoint, look at right here. Open the textbook, at right here. Google it. But they don't ask what is. They don't say what is the duty for, you know, expected mothers. The answer is do a risk assessment. All of this is a do a risk assessment. They don't say what is the, like, what is the law then for doing a, the, 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 like, so there's no question like that. Because there's no what is question since the pandemic, right? And if there are, because it's an open book test, Open the book, Google it, find it on the slide. But there are no questions like that because the exam may be too easy. They don't ask what is or what are anymore, right? So that's where we back to this slide here, right? So what I was saying, Nibosh is twofold where, like how you had the definition of culture then, you had to know that for exam. Culture is the individual and the group or the managers. You had to know that. You had to know human factors, right? So... Likewise, this one is double-edged, meaning that you have to know this for exam, but you also have to know it for you, right? Like if you're staying in safety, you have to know this for you, right? You have to know that, um, that you have to know these steps, right? The steps in doing a risk assessment, the steps in doing a risk assessment is like what we call the ABCs of safety. As a safety officer, then you have to know how to do a risk assessment, right? So even though this exam is an open book exam, you should learn this. Not for the exam, but for you, because remember, you have to do a risk assessment, right? This is like an interview question. I've actually heard, you know, I've heard students say, right, that... When they go for interviews then, they ask that, well, how do you do a risk assessment? And I actually had one student, I, I wouldn't call his name. I could call his name. I'll call his name, Stephen, right? That he went on interview and they asked the question and he didn't know because he didn't learn it because it's an open book exam. So that's I said, Nibosh is twofold in that some things are for exam, but then some things this are real life. No one in Trinidad is going to ask you what is the management regulation. But the thing is, you should know that doing a risk assessment in Trinidad and in Guyana is a legal requirement. It's in the OSHAC of both countries. And Trinidad is actually in section 25 and Guyana is 45. The OSHAC in Trinidad and Tobago is actually part two, section 25. That says to do a risk assessment. But nobody would really ask that unless they're going to interview. Guyana is part two, section 45. Right. So let's have a read of them, right? So the things, if you have the book again, I'll just hold it up here. See the same thing anyway, right? So the thing is, what do you want to learn? You want to learn this for you. And I'll show you the piece will come for the exam, just so how it will come, because you know it will come different. They wouldn't say what is, because we already said they are no what what is question. But this comes, but it comes in another way. Right? So the five steps is identify the hazard. Second step. So the first step is identify the hazards. Second step, decide who might be harmed and how. 
third step is that you want to evaluate the risk and decide if your precautions, precautions is another word for control. Precautions are another word for control. So if your controls are effective, then evaluate the risk and see if your present controls are effective. That's a nice way of saying that. But remember, this is how it's said in the booklet. Look, look the link to the booklet here. Remember I said this is actually a booklet, right? So like, I can't make it up. I can explain it and say it another way, but the way it said is the way we have to type it, right? The second, sorry, not the second, the, the, the fourth step, record your findings and implement them. And the fifth step, review your assessment and update if necessary, right? So see if we could take a, a 30 seconds and see if we could digest it a bit. There was an acronym to remember, it, but remember you're not required to remember anymore, but I could still give any acronym. Let me still give you the acronym, right? The acronym was IDEA, I -D, right? I D E. Well, kind of spell like in a in a that kind of right. I D E R R. So that was an acronym students had used before the pandemic to remember the five steps. Identify the hazard. Decide who could be harmed. Evaluate the risk, record and review. But you all don't need an acronym today because you all, it's a book test, right? You, you all have it much easier than the students before. Plus you all have 24 hours to do eight questions before they had two hours to do 11 questions. The only difference is though, the difference is that they used to ask them what, well, what is? So like a question before will be, what are the five steps of doing a risk assessment? You just have to remember it. Some say the exam now is easier. Some say the exam then was easier. To me, it doesn't matter because it's Nibosh exam anyway. We just have to get it done, right? All right, so let me show you something, right? So I'm gonna, so do, so do you all have the paper, like some writing paper that asks for, because what I want to show you, I wanna show you that those steps, but let me show you what I have on this slide first and then I'll come back to the writing thing, right? So those steps are the same steps that are on the table. See if you can see that, watch it. I'm gonna try to grab the marker a bit, right? The steps in a NIBOS risk assessment is that you identify the hazard, right? The effects here, if you read this carefully, this is actually who could be harmed. Watch it. People in the vicinity, people in the vicinity, right? You say, what are your existing controls? This I'll come back to this. But this is right here anyway. What are the existing controls? This is more like the format you have to do in what I want to tell you just now, right? Then they evaluate the risk. This is where you do the risk calculation. You see what's the likelihood out of a scale of one to five. What's the severity out of a scale of one to five? Five by four is 20. So you evaluate the, the risk. You record. The sheet itself is a record. And then you review. Now, what is not me missing to the end here is the review date. But I didn't put it here because Nibosh doesn't have the review date in the risk assessment. They have it in the end, like in a paragraph. So that's why I didn't put it here. But if you are in a company, some companies, they put the review date in another column there. Nibosh doesn't do that. So the review date comes like in a, a doc, well, not a document, but a couple of lines under the table, right? You say, well, the review date is every year. So I would set the review date as the 21st of the sixth month, 2025. Right? That's what Nibosh wanted to do it. Right? Tell me if you're okay with it. So what I wanted to understand here, let's kind of recap and see if I get what I wanted it to get. Right? So what I wanted to get, the first thing is that doing a risk assessment is the law. In any country, in England, Trinidad, Guyana. Exam-wise, they don't really ask you if you want to talk about exam. Exam-wise, they don't really say what is the name of the law. 
But if they should ask, which they have not asked, I just said in here, if they should ask, what is the name of the law that said to do a risk assessment is the first thing in the chapter and is the first thing on this slide here. But they have not asked this during the pandemic because they are no what is or what are questions. Tell me if you're okay with that. So what you need to understand is doing a risk assessment is the law. Are you all okay with that so far? Okay, next thing. Next thing you need to know. So doing a risk assessment, it have some steps to it. And in the world today, they use what is called the five steps of doing a risk assessment. All companies, some people add to the columns or they will add to the table, but there is like a global five steps then. The five steps is actually in a document called INDG 163. I watching to see if the book made mention of that because these steps were not written by the, I mean, they were written by the author, but the author didn't make up the steps and these steps are taken from INDG 163, right? So if I was the author, I would have given credit. They must have said it somewhere, but it's a fine end. But look at right on this slide. You don't have to find it anywhere else if it's right on this slide looking at you. And I just said INDG 163. But um, probably because it's a certificate version too. Normally, if a diploma student is, is talking about the five steps, you must give credit to where it came from. And it didn't come from your textbook. It came from this booklet here, INDG 163, right? So the five steps, um, do you all understand that? They should learn this for yourself. Yeah, everybody okay with that? Learn this for you. Don't just learn it for exam. Don't be like Steve and Dan. Don't go to an interview and when they ask what is the five steps. You all remember what I told you, Stephen said, I didn't say it today, I don't know if I said it to you all before. Stephen told them, he didn't get that job. Another one of my students got that job. I don't know if anybody know that other student. And let me see if anybody know. Uh, I don't think so. But some people may know, but um, maybe more some of the one or two repeaters, right? That student today, he is the safety. He got it with this no, last month, right? He's the safety manager for Nutramix. So if you have any deals with Nutramix, the safety from there is from here. Same as Atlantic LNG and a hundred different companies around Trinidad and in Guyana at the moment, right? Anyway, um, so one day will be your turn. But when but like when I send you my interview, right? Don't, you know, the company called me back and said, Well, his answer was. Stephen's answer was, it was an open book ex exam we did. And if I need to know the steps, I would open the book and see it. That's not what you tell people in an interview, right? So some things I tell you, you have to know for you. Something you have to know for exam. And something both. Like this, I think, is both, right? Okay, the other thing I wanted to catch is, do you all understand that the, the five steps now is sometimes shown on a table? It's shown on a table like this. The steps are captured on a table. A risk assessment is like that. Right? Um, are you all okay with that? Are you all okay with like the risk assessment being on a table format? Yes, okay, good. And then risk assessments have to be reviewed. They have to be updated because things may change. You could have a readout of this, the record review, right? And that's about it for this lesson. So then why did I have you bring writing paper for today, right? So let me take all of this off. I think I'll keep it at the five steps. And let me keep it on the five steps. I'll keep it right here. Right. So what I want to tell you now, the, the rest of this now is about your Nibosh project. So we want to have a little discussion in the next 20 minutes about the Nibosh project. But as I tell you, you need to have some writing paper. If you don't have it, well, you can play back the video. But if you have it, you can start to take some pointers on the project from right now, because the project is a risk assessment. Um, I would ask you all, let me just get some water, right? I would ask you all, if you don't understand anything I'm going to say, please just ask. You all are kind of quiet. I know the first class in the morning does be like that. We didn't know kind of roll out a bed on a Saturday. But I've been up since five, right? So I'm ready to go. Let's get some water and we'll start this project this Saturday. So 
when you first had orientation, and the orientation may be on the WhatsApp group too, I'm not sure, or it's on the YouTube channel, right? No, I don't want to talk too much. I want to kind of give you some stuff, right? So that you have some stuff to work with, right? So let's kind of start. So the project, we would have mentioned that the project is called NG2 and it's your second textbook. Yes, you do have a second textbook. If you don't have it as yet, like I said, one or two folks in Guyana don't have it as yet. It's okay. I'm going to tell you what you need to get. The truth is, half of this class wouldn't even open that second textbook to do the project. And the truth is, you don't even need to do that. You don't really need to open it. But you could, because again, it's like the information is there more than once then. If you open it fine, you don't open it fine because the information is there more than once. It's in more than one places, right? So the project, if you want to know, it's called NG2. I just doing some quick recaps here, right? Now you must pass the project to get your certificate. So the long and short of this is before the pandemic, I don't think I have much repeaters in this class, which is good, eh? I mean... I think some of them went to another class. But um, I don't think anybody, I'm looking at you all, I don't think I have any repeaters here. You, you all are not repeaters, right? None of you all are. Which is good. That's a good sign. Hey, by the way, do you all know one of my students? You know, I say these things and I know I just have to, it's not that I have to prove it to you, right? But uh, you know, one of our students, I tell you, was featured in a graduation booklet in Nibosh, was the only featured student in the world. I don't know if you understand that. You probably don't understand it because you feel that, you know, is what it is, right? But in the world, whole of the UK, trying to see, this morning, right? Um, One of my students in the degree, he messaged me. He told me he got a particular mark, right? Now the mark was actually 84. Now, that's at the degree level, and that is actually the highest. That's actually the highest in the region, right? When we say region, we talk about Trinidad and Guyana here. Probably Grenada, too, because I have some folks in Grenada, too, right? So this is a student here. I got the highest, you know, in the region. And that mark. I think it's going to be a high worldwide mark in that in the graduation book again for 2024, they are going to feature him again. Well, not him again, but they'll feature another student from this school. Right? And I'm, I'm not talking about, I see some of y'all don't understand. Remember, Nibosh is in England. So it's not my graduation book. It's, it's a worldwide graduation book. Right? Uh, we have a copy, a couple. I, I don't know. I normally have one in the desk here, but I think I've tried to find that tape for y'all before. And, um, I move it around. Oh, look at here. I don't know if I, but yeah, I must have shown you, right? This is graduation booklet 2022. This is not my booklet. This is from England itself, right? The graduation is in Birmingham, the graduation book, right? And this is a student from here. There's, there's no other pictures in this book. I don't know if you can see that, right? The, the book is just names there. That's Nibosh alumni. When you finish, you can join alumni. But it's just names of graduates now, right? But it's one pitier. And it's of Shadrach Safety Institute. A student here. Uh, this person was a bank teller. Let me see if I could find what they do with her pitier. Yeah. She was a bank teller, but today she's a safety. Right? She did the certificate. She went on and she did the degree. I have to do work for that company as well as she is in today. Right? Anyway, um... So the long and short of it is that you all do well, Trinidadians, guy, but Guyanese normally do well, right? Um, I haven't had anybody that got 84 though. So this mark here puts Trinidad back on top because, but let's say Trinidad, I mean, like to me, it's, it's one school, Shadrach Safety Institute. Doesn't matter if we have students in Guyana or Grenada, wherever have you, right? London, it's one school, but just, you know, like countrywide now, you know, like, um, like she is Trinidad and then it had from Guyana, Janelle Lewis, but I think this guy took it back here to Trinidad. Now, and it's not about that to me. It's, it's one school. It's uh, Shadrack Safety in Guyana. It's the same as Shadrack Safety in Trinidad. And it's just me. I am the lecturer anyway for both of those courses anyway, right? Anyway, so the point is, you could do it. That's the point. The point is you can do it, right? But the thing is the same is that you have to pass, right? And before the pandemic, I was saying, every subject you pass, you used to get a suit. Are you all writing this down? 
But today, to get the cert, you have to pass the exam and the project. Now, if by some means you are thinking the project is easy, it probably is, but it's something you have to work towards. We can remember we don't correct it here. So some people find this a feeling, the one that they thought they would not have failed. As we start this after say these now, right? So some people say, well, I thought the project was easy. Well, it is because people have been getting, you know, high marks. But the thing is you had to work, right? You had to work to get it done. If you don't work to get it done, if you pass the exam and you fail the project, but then you get no certificate, you have to do over the project, right? So the pass mark on the project is just pass. They don't have a mark. I may have mentioned this to you all on the orientation, how the project is marked. It is really like a risk table, like what you just saw, right? It's actually pass or, pass or refill. It doesn't have a mark. So if you pass, you just see pass. And if you fail, you just see refill, which means you have to go and do over the project, right? So that's going to get to some quick things there, right? So the project could be done at home. Please take your notes on this. The project could be done at home. And it is essentially a risk assessment with 10 hazards in it. You could write more than I write. If you find I say something faster than you could write it, well, I could write it fine. The risk assessment could be done at home. When I say at home, you're not doing it in your house enough. I, I don't mean it like that. I mean to say you don't have to go to Exxon or you don't have to go to Gisby in Guyana or you don't have to go to Massey. You, you can just sit home and get it done. It's a kind of tabletop project, right? So you don't have to go to Atlantic. You don't have to go down to Junior Sami, Guyana, and Trinidad. Well, they don't like Junior Sami in Guyana. Junior, Junior Sami making mess in Guyana, right? This is a true thing, and you know? he lost a contract across it because, you know, definitely Masha. So when I say you can do it, from home, you can do it at any workplace, real or imagined. So you could probably make, put that here, you can make up a company then. So what uh, folks would have said from home, I mean, it, I'm, I'm trying to say that you do not have to go anywhere. You can sit down in your house and type out this project using your imagination, right? Or you could do it from somewhere real. The thing is, if you choose real, you're still going to have to imagine some things. I'll tell you why that is so in a bit. Because you see, they have a format, you see. You going to Junior Sami doesn't make it any different to somebody who's sitting at home and just thinking about 10 hazards. Doesn't make a difference. You see, Nibosh is not seeing you going to Junior Sami. Right? Anyway, I'll explain some of that just now, right? So real or imagine or a combination of both. So you can change the name of the company instead of saying Paria for Daryl or anybody else. You can say this risk assessment was completed on Pacific. You can just make up a name. I'm trying to write what I would imagine here for you. Or a bit of both. Um, any one of you here look at wrestling? I mean, you must be familiar with wrestling. We all know who The Rock is, Dwayne Johnson. So you all look at wrestling, right? Adnan? Yeah? I know Adnan is my wrestling friend, yeah. Right? So, so, say it again. Oh, probably that wasn't for me. Any one of you look at wrestling here? So you all have seen wrestling. Stone Cold, Steve Austin, The Rock. You want to say something now? Say, say yeah, something. Correct. Okay, I mean, say to what I'm talking about. So you all look at wrestling. Okay, yeah. So wrestling, now, if you wonder why am I talking about See, wrestling is a mixture of both. Wrestling is a mixture of real and fake. It's a mixture of both. That's what your project is. You, you can change the name of the company. If the company have two workers or 10 workers, you can say they have 15 workers. Right? You can say, so the exact, and even if you go to a company, if you go to Junior Sammy, right? You might be able to see all 10 workers, but they say, look, it have two part-time workers, a contractor, so then you just average 15. Real or imagined doesn't really make a difference. 
half can be made up, half can be, you know, fake. In fact, if you're making up, even if you go to a real company, I'm telling you something just now, you're going to have to use some hazards that are really from a specific place then. So it didn't matter if you really go, you were sitting at home, the hazards are coming from one place, right? Anyway, let's go on. So the thing is, is um, feel free to make up a name of your company, right? So the hazards is 10 hazards minimum. It's 10 hazards on the RA table minimum. You can give them more than 10, but you cannot give them less than 10. You can give them more than 10, like 11, but you can't give them less than 10. So it's about 10 hazards. Please take a note of this. Please take a note of this as I wanted to write. And here the thing, right? This is what I was talking about, real and imagine too. Nibosh gives you a pool or a table of hazards to choose from. I like to call it the pool, right? So they give you a pool of hazards to choose from. Let me see if I have it on my desk here. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, it's simple, right? <laughs> it's a pool of hazards to choose from. But what I said, what it mean is that, what I was saying is that you didn't really have to go to Junior Sami to know that a hazard is fire because they're giving you a list to choose from. You understand that, folks? It's very easy. It's not hard. Look at the list here. They give you a list of hazards to choose from, right? So your 10 hazards must come from this list. I want you all to write that down. Folks, you can write more than what I am writing. I've already written pool and I've already written 10 hazards. Your 10 is coming from a sheet. You think you understand that? So here the main thing I want you to know. If it is not on this sheet, you cannot use it. So that's all I was saying. Real and imagined didn't make a difference because if you go down to a fabrication shop, if you go down to a restaurant, you head down to Bakewell in Guyana to do your risk assessment. And you see, you know, like a, a hot oven. You cannot use that. Anybody can say why you cannot use a hot oven? If you head to a fabrication shop and you see, um, like, a, let's say you see, I'm trying to think of, let that, okay, let's say you see like, um, I try to make up one that not that not here, right? Let's say you see something like a crushing hazard, right? The thing is you have to choose the hazards from here. So this is why even if you go in person, it's only if you see it here you could use it, not if you see it in the company. If you see it in the company, that's like an identifier. So if you see, okay, well, there's an electrical, you know, cord that's faulty, well, you could use electrical. But not because you saw the electrical cord, but because there is a list. Nibosh gave you a list to limit you. Now, on this list, it has many hazards. Like, look at the first one here. Help me read this one because I can't read upside down. This is what? Noise is a hazard. Can you use vibration? Yes. Can you use radiation? Yes. Can you use mental ill health? Yes. Could you use violence at work? Yes. You could use it. Right, so maybe you are using a, a a company, a hospital company, a medical facility, and they have trespassers there, and you see an irate customer. Well, you you could use violence at work, but not because you see an irate customer, but really because it is in the list, violence at work. So as I said, you could just sit down home and you can say, well, if I choose a medical facility or like a hospital area or somebody that have customers, a hazard is all about the what? What was the definition for hazard is whatever have the what? Whatever have they? Potential to cause harm. Yeah. So you can tell yourself, sitting in your nice home sofa, listen to your music, well, I could use violence at work. I don't physically have to go down in the company to see two workers fighting to see violence at work. So that's what I said, real and imagine. Do you all understand what I meant by that now? And you will be given this document. Right? You will be given this document to choose the hazard from. Now, folks, you know, as much as I say that, there is somebody here. There is somebody here who didn't write this down. 
and there's somebody here out of the 21 of you, there's somebody here that will go and put their own hazard still and fail. Tell me how that is possible. Tell me how that is possible. That some of you would not get what I just said there. I'll say it one more time. If the hazard is on this list, you could use it. If it's not on this list, you cannot use it. Right? Like if you see slips and trips, look at there, you could use slips and trips. If it's in your, wherever you're making up slips and trips, if you see there's a, a loose cord, you could use slips and trips. And you could just be sitting at home too and say, well, I think in an office there could be a slip and trip hazard. So I'm going to use slips and trips. You could use it. If it's not here, you cannot use it. And look how much it have on this list. You only need 10. You only need 10. You can put 11 if you want. No problem. You can put 12 if you want. No problem. You cannot put 9. If you put 9, you fail. Right? So Nibosh is very clear with the instructions. Right? And I'll give you all of this when I get back. Remember, next week, Saturday, we have no classes. Right? I'm in Guyana. I'm just moving operations. It's just a whole week of work again. But that's how it is, right? Because we have, you know, Shadrach said this also day as well, right? Um, tell me if I understand what I said. So far, it's 21 minutes past 10. I think I could wrap up here. Or if I want, I could probably just share one more fact about the project. Yeah, I'll share one more fact about the project. But not really a fact on the project, but a fact about the project, right? Tell me if you're okay so far. So let's recap the Nibosh project. You have to pass it. You don't really have to go anywhere to get it done. It's just like a table. It may take you some time, right? And how I do it, I would do it line by line with you, paragraph by paragraph with you. You shouldn't get it wrong, right? Um, but you don't have to worry about getting any special permission to go to any company. In short, if I could try to move this slide, the risk assessment is something like what you saw here. But it's like 10 hazards, right? And you have to fill it out in much more detail because this is just a PowerPoint. It's like a table on top with about six rows on top. Is it columns? Sorry, six columns. And uh, I think it's five and I don't think it's six. Anyway, but I'll give you the format for that when we start. Today was just the introduction in 10 because we started risk assessments, right? Um, 10 hazards is sufficient. You fill it out nice and neat. You are good to go. And let me see if you have any questions. I saw two things in the chat and I will share one more thing about the project and then we would end it there for today. Now, if next week, right, you know, you know, here's something funny, right, folks? I'll just, you know, you know, this project is on the YouTube channel. I could send you this like next week. You didn't have to miss class. I am not there, but you don't have to miss class. I could send you the recording for next week on the WhatsApp group. It's how much of you would look at it. You see, it's all about what you want. I have done that before, right? And students, I had two students, Nigel and Jeffrey. They are from SIS. I, I gave them that. And I was so worried. I said, you know, Nigel and Jeffrey, if anybody know them in our SIS, right? I was like, um, you like you all don't need anything else? They was like, no, just give us the sample, give us the recording, and they did it on the pass. Some other students are so hand to mouth. Everything. As an adult, right? I mean, this, this, by the way, do you all know that NG2 is meant to be an assessment? The project is meant to be an exam, huh? right? But what I'm saying is that if you all want, I could send you the recording for next week, but I'll probably send it for you tonight because I'm, I'm leaving Trinidad tomorrow, right? Um, but you don't have to miss class. The recordings are there. All of that is what you want. Okay, two things on the chat, and then anybody have any question? So does the hazard listing change for the different classes? No, or is it the same hazards for, for all? Masha, the hazard listing does not change. Um, no, it's the same, it's the same listing, right? So if you wanted to know, well, it actually have a little bit more. Remember today we just touched the surface of it, right? So what is different? Because you see, then it's possible for all of you to choose fire. And that is okay. Mamba telling the project is easy. So how could it be different? How could Masha Company be different to America Company? The thing is, when you put fire, you have to put an example of the fire that you are seeing. So for one person, it may be somebody was smoking. For another person, it could have been that there was an electrical fault. So that's how it becomes unique to your company then. 
right? Because you are all given the same hazard sheet, right? Now, let me say what I want. Folks, anybody have any questions? Let me just take one question, two questions. And I'll get the rule and I'll tell you the last thing I wanted to say because time is almost up on us already. Any questions? Okay, so the last thing I'll tell you, right, is that, hear this, right? We check, well, two things. I don't know if you want to write it down. So you want to write it down for me and just save me the writing time with this marker. So Nebo should actually give you a sample. Yeah, we have one to work with. For some strange reason, people don't use it. Like if, like if somebody give me a sample of something and say, do one just like this, I would use it. And again, people who use the sample don't have any errors in it. One or two maybe that, that, that we'll pick up on. You are given a sample. You know why it's weird? You know why it's weird, folks? You know why it's weird? You know why it's weird? There was another school here in Trinidad and Tobago, right? And Guyana, there's another school too, right? That school never gave their students a sample. And you know, people is surpassing. The school out of business now in Trinidad, right? That school did not give their students a sample. And people pass it. So how it is in my school, Shadrach Safety, right? You're getting a sample. You're getting the videos on YouTube, right? And I get, give, I'll give you the last one now. We do look at your draft and you're still getting it wrong. How is that possible? Now I found this to be more so for Trinidad and not Guyana. The answer is some people don't listen, right? Well, as I say, who can't hear will feel because you'll have to do it over, right? Guyana pass rate is 100%. Trinidad pass rate is not 100%. Just to tell you, some people don't listen, right? I'll say it one more time. Guyana pass rate on the project is 100%. Trinidad is not 100%. Same teacher, same class, same everything, same thing I'm saying. Right? So if you look back at this, right? So you are given a sample, a walk in your true what you have to do, which the other school never did. We check in your draft and giving you back a feedback. No one have a reason to fail. I do my job. I do my job. There's a reason why Shadrach Safety is the number one Nibosh provider in the region. But not everybody in Trinidad pass it. Maybe this will be the first class. The last class I had where everybody passed the project in Trinidad could have been, was before the pandemic. Guyana is always getting full passes, 100, 100, 100. Can they listen? Probably because they're more driven, they're more hungry, right? Us in Trinidad, listen to everybody else, right? You know, after giving this sample, you know what some of you will do? Some of you will go online and find our next sample, which is not up to date with the syllabus. Some of you will call some of your friends who did this course before, which did a, a version of the project, which is not up to date to the syllabus. But you wouldn't use what we give you, a sample, right? Look, one of the lecturers is telling me, right? A lecturer is telling me, he corrected a sample project of a student and told the student what to do, and the student said no. The student said, well, um, this is how it is in my company. Well, fail, and come back and pay the money and do it over, right? I don't know how else to say to or, or to say this because I have to say it like this. You see, we don't say that this. You all, for anybody listening to this video on the worldwide, you know, YouTube, this is how Trinidadians are. We we have to talk like this. It may seem harsh, but it's not harsh. It's not harsh at all. Because if we just if if I just write this down here and don't emphasize it, nobody follows it. People put their own hazards. They go online. They download a project. They do something as a neighbor say not to do, and you will fail. Right? Remember, I cannot pass you. I can help you. I can guide you. I'm your coach. The coach can tell you what to do. But then when it's time to play the game, you are the play. The, the, the coach is going there to play. You are the one that have to play. Right? Folks, I'm going to stop the recording here. I would make it my business to... um. If, if you all please message me if you want the recording. It's already on YouTube. Some of you all have subscribed already. If you haven't, well, you're kind of just wasting time again. That's like buying KFC and leaving it. You buy it. Five, how much does this cost? Seven thousand dollars. You, you pay seven thousand dollars in KFC and you leave all on the counter right there. And then you're hungry and say, Well, how come how come you're hungry? Right? You pay for it, but you're not using it. 